Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to the Japan Information Culture Center, the JICC, this evening. My name is Takehiro Shimada. I'm a Minister for Com Communication and Cultural Affairs and Director of the JICC. <coughs> the JICC is committed to enriching the uh, relationship between Japan and the United States for the past 35 years. The JICC has been providing cultural events and education programming to promote better understanding of Japan and Japanese culture. Tonight is a closing lecture for Unfolding the Universe, our origami exhibition featuring works of art from 21 computer, uh, computer scientists, mathematicians, and origami masters from across the country. Please join me thanking the Gabriela, Gabriela, Gabriela and the Paul Rosenheim Foundation and Mrs. Patsy Wang Iberson for their general support. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank Origami USA and the 21 artists who have made this exhibition possible. When you think of, of origami, you may not think, uh, immediately think of computer scientists and the mathematicians. But as you walk through the exhibition this evening, you no doubt saw the origami goes beyond animal and flower shapes and includes fascinating scientific and mathematical displays. Scientists and mathematicians have been using origami in new and unusual ways for decades. There are airbags, giant folding solar panels that follow origami principles. And there is even something called a fold scope, which you probably saw coming in. It's an actual microscope that's produced affordably from paper, and quality is produced, quality it produces is similar to conventional research microscopes. So today, in addition to being a well-loved well -loved pastime enjoyed by many, origami is also helping to advance math, science, and technology around the world. To tell us more, we are fortunate to be joined tonight by Professor Eric DeMay, listening over there, the world leading theorist in computational origami and professor of computer science at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Currently, Professor DeMay, along with his father, Martin DeMay, who is also sitting right next to Eric. Uh, work together, floating between designing sculptures and providing theorems and back again. Professor, we are honored to have you here at the JICC tonight, and I look forward to hearing about your contributions. Following tonight's lecture, one lucky audience member will be randomly selected to receive Origami 6, one and, uh, Volume 1 and 6. Uh, these, books on uh, these books on origami and its application in mathematics, technology, art, and education were written and uh, edited by several prominent origami artists, mathematics, mathematicians, and scientists. Make sure to hold on to your ticket on your program for your chance to win these in informative books. And before we forget, uh, we are hosting the uh, uh, exhibition of Japanese ceramics next week, and also we have the same type of lecture by the, uh, on the uh, Japanese art by the uh, uh, lecturer from the uh, Kuriya Sakura Gallery next week. Next week. And now uh, we would like to uh, you know, introduce the uh, Professor uh, Eric Dimen here on this board, and uh, please uh, join us to uh, welcoming the uh, Professor. Thanks, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, I want to share with you um, my perspective on origami. Uh, and uh, this grows out of uh, many years of playing around and folding things. Um, but actually, my interest in origami comes from uh, my interest in geometry and mathematics. Um, and I got turned on to the art side of origami through my dad, Martin Domain, who's here in the front as well. And uh, his background is more in visual arts. My background is more math and computer science. 
and we've known each other a long time, <laughs> and we've taught each other a lot, so we're both now mathematicians, computer scientists, and we're both artists, and we write papers together, uh, we make sculpture together, like the things you saw outside, and origami in particular has been a really uh, fun area for us to explore both sides, to think about paper folding from an artistic perspective and from a scientific perspective. Both turn out to be really rich and exciting, and they feed back into each other a lot. And so I wanted to share with you that, that perspective. And of course, there's also lots of connections to Japan, and origami is the reason I started visiting Japan uh, about 20 years ago, uh, and it's been a really fun, fun experience. So uh, I want to tell you a little story about how we got to this point, uh, which starts before I was born. Uh, there was the Domain Glass Studio in New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, this is my dad. He looks a lot like I do now, actually. Uh, and so this is in the late 60s, early 70s. He was the father of Canadian glass. He made uh, goblets for the Queen of England. Uh, he was the first uh, glass blower in Canada. And this is the beginning of his interest in craft and art. Um, and then our first collaboration uh, was when I was five years old. This is me. I've changed a little bit, but he looks about the same as that now. Uh, and we made these uh, wire take-apart puzzles uh, and sold them to toy stores across Canada. It's called the Eric and Dad Puzzle Company. Uh, I spent the money 50-50. That's good. I was a good businessman then. Uh, and this is probably the beginning of my interest in puzzles and, and also mathematics. Uh, then when I was ages 7 to 11, we traveled around mostly East Coast of the United States, a few different places. I was born up here in Halifax, Canada. Um, and this was a really fun time for us to explore lots of different cultures within the United States, meet lots of different people with different backgrounds. Um, we started doing homeschool during this time, initially because we had to, because we were traveling a lot, but then we uh, fell in love with it. Homeschool worked, with, worked really well for both of us. Um, I could explore uh, the whole world of computer science uh, and in a way that maybe school couldn't. Uh, but especially what was, was really powerful for us was the kind of breaking down the barriers. And we talked to all sorts of different people, not just, I wouldn't just meet with other students in my grade level in my school, but I would talk to all the neighbors of varying ages and backgrounds and learn from them what they knew. Uh, and I think this led to our current approach, which is very collaborative. Uh, we write papers with uh, hundreds of people, I think, if you can count them, 434, I think, currently, um, and many of them are from Japan. Uh, and you know, collaboration is a very powerful tool, especially in science, and it's quite common in science, that we're trying to bring it also into the art world, where instead of worrying about ego and things like that, trying to break down those barriers and get people to make things together that no one person could make. Uh, I think that's very exciting. And it's, a, it's a good way to work. And I think especially across disciplines, like between art and science, we get some really exciting, exciting work. We uh, have been at MIT for the last uh, 16 years. And this is the building we work in. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a very fun and creative place. There's lots of uh, scientists there, obviously. And there's also lots of artists and lots of tools for making both science and robots, but also art and sculpture. Uh, so today I want to focus in particular on origami, um, and this is, you, there's a little uh, sheet outside about the, uh, some, the history of origami. It's not known exactly when it started. Paper started around 2,000 years ago. When exactly origami happened, we're not sure. This is uh, probably the oldest book about origami uh, from the late 1700s, and it documents that the paper crane you may recognize. And this is actually three cranes made out of a single piece of paper. It's a one by three rectangle with two slits, and each square gets folded into a crane. And if you're careful, you won't tear the corners, and the, you know, the wing tips are connected to the head of the crane and so on. Um, and you can make hundreds of cranes out of one piece of paper by this kind of cutting and folding technique. Uh, in modern times, uh, partly out of uh, the American minimalism uh, movement, we the a lot of origamists have restricted to a uh, more strict form where you just take one square of paper and don't make any cuts. So as you might imagine, the sorts of things you can make are much simpler than this. Um, in fact, they've gotten incredibly complicated. Uh, so each of these is folded from one square of paper, no cuts. 
Um, this is one of the leading Japanese young uh, designers. Uh, so uh, three-headed Cerberus, a dragon with about a thousand scales. Um, you know, incredibly complicated models. This is already uh, 10 years ago, and each year we see more and more crazy designs. This was a, a design competition several years ago to make a sailboat. Uh, this, for example, is a boat that's been broken in half by a giant kraken, <laughs> all from one square of paper. Uh, those top three designers were MIT students. Uh, and, you know, this, this is the MIT logo. You've got, uh, if your piece of paper is white on one side, black on the other, you can do color reversal and make cool color patterns. Each of these, one square of paper, no cuts. Uh, and this origami revolution has been made possible because we understand more and more about the mathematics and the computer science about how, how paper folding works and how you can uh, uh, use uh, mathematics to design. So, uh, for example, Jason Koo uh, is a lecturer at MIT right now. Uh, he was my PhD student, and when he was a high school student, he designed this uh, hyper-realistic butterfly. And he didn't just pick up a square of paper and start folding and hoping it would end up looking like a butterfly. He planned out and designed which parts of the paper were going to be used by which parts of the model. And there's a mathematical theory for that correspondence, and every advanced origami designer knows that theory, even if they don't consider themselves a mathematician, they, they use mathematics in order to solve these design problems. Um, that theory is called the tree theory, or the tree method of origami design, uh, co-developed by many uh, Japanese origami artists and Robert Lang in the United States uh, over several years, uh, 80s and 90s. And then uh, we've been working on formalizing it over the past 10 years now, or almost done. Um, and proving that it always works. So what does it do? Uh, it lets you design a kind of origami stick figure uh, where you say, I'd like a lizard, and it's got a head, and it's got some legs, and a body, and then some hind legs, and then a tail. And you get to specify the length of all these segments. You get to specify how they're connected together. You can draw any stick figure you want. And then the algorithm tells you, here's the best way to fold a square piece of paper into an origami structure that has one flap of paper for each segment over here, and the lengths are, are match up. Uh, so you could imagine shaping this into a lizard. Uh, here's a more complicated example. Maybe you want to make a scorpion. So you design your uh, stick figure for get all the right legs and pinchers and so on. Um, and then you uh, plug this into, there's actually uh, free software online that will do this for you. It's called TreeMaker. It gives you this crease pattern. You fold it. It's hard to see here, but there's one flap of paper for each segment over here. It's just They're all stacked on top of each other. Uh, but if this is in 3D, you'd be able to manipulate all the parts and turn it into a scorpion. Um, and that, it looks hard to go from there to there. Um, origami artists are quite good at this, and the step is actually not that difficult. Uh, but as a geometer, it's a little unsatisfying. I'd like to know, um, can I use a, an algorithm, a computer program, to go to design exactly how to fold a scorpion. Um, this has been a very powerful tool, and, and basically all the advanced origami I showed you uses this technique. But can we go further? Um, so way back uh, when I was a graduate student and started thinking about origami with my dad and, um, and a colleague, Joe Mitchell, we were wondering, uh, what shapes can you fold from a square? Sort of the most basic question. Can I fold any polygon? Uh, this is not drawn to scale. You need a bigger square to fold a horse this size. But uh, you know, can I fold this polygon or any polygon? Could, if the paper is white on one side, black on the other, can I fold any two color pattern? Or in three dimensions, can I make any uh, polyhedron, any uh, 3D surface made out of flat sides? Um, and the answer turns out to be yes. You can always do this for any uh, 3D surface with two color pattern. If you have a large enough square of paper, you can fold it. And we even knew a method to do it back then, uh, but we didn't know a good method. This method would probably take a piece of paper the size of the moon and fold you know, a small horse. Uh, so still left a lot to figure out. Uh, but recently, we have a, a new method called Organizer, uh, which we just published this year. Uh, though the idea goes, is again 10 years old. Um, and there's free software online. You can give it an arbitrary 3D model. Uh, this is a classic 3D model that computer scientists like to play with. It was originally a plastic bunny that they 3D scanned. Um, and you plug it into the software, it gives you this crease pattern. 
you fold it from a square, I didn't draw it here, uh, solid lines you fold one way, dashed lines you fold the other way. It takes about 10 hours and you get your bunny out of one square paper. Um, so this is going straight to the 3D shape fully automatically and it's relatively practical. About 30% of the, the paper ends up on the surface of this model. So it's quite efficient. Um, and here's an example of actually folding such a thing. Uh, this is uh, my collaborator Tomohiro Tachi, um, who originally came up with Organizer and then we proved that it works. This, um, unlike paper, this is a sheet of steel that we've laser cut with a half a kilowatt laser. Uh, we've cut some additional holes out of the middle to, because metal is a lot thicker than paper. Uh, but it holds a crease really well, and so the sun just set. Uh, and this also <laughs> took about 10 hours. This is uh, at MIT. And eventually we get our steel one. Uh, so cool, right? Um, so the, the vision here is this, this is a way to make arbitrary 3D shapes. It's like 3D printing, uh, but uh, origami is a really efficient way to make 3D surfaces. If you want a light, thin structure, uh, you can take any material that can hold a crease, like metal or paper or plastics, um, and automate the design of where, what uh, cut pattern, what creases you want to fold, and then you just need the origamis to go there and fold the thing, but you can imagine shipping uh, products in you know, their flat state, be much more efficient shipping-wise, uh, and you just have your on-site origamis ready to deploy. <laughs> uh, here's a little sketch of what it looks like to do these kinds of origamizer designs. Um, the idea is you have some uh, triangles that make up your surface, drawn in white here, and then you have the stuff in between which you just want to get rid of, and so this is a little animation of folding away the other stuff. Um, it's quite complicated to get the details right, but uh, you can end up with just the triangles of your surface and the rest of your paper is folded away and hidden beneath the surface. Um, and if you've seen this uh, recent NOVA documentary, The Origami Revolution, it talks about uh, this organizer thing, among other things, that brought about uh, engineering applications of origami to um, I want to talk about a different origami design algorithm. It's a little bit older. Uh, it came out of an art project. Uh, a friend of mine had a new biology result that was about to appear in Nature about how the human genome folds and he wanted a graphic to illustrate this. He said, hey, you guys fold stuff, can you make something? And so we came up with this folding of a square of paper. It has the one human chromosome printed on it. Um, and we folded it into this thing uh, called a Hilbert curve. It's a space filling curve. And it was related to the theory that he was trying to illustrate. And so, oh, that's, that's cool. You know, we made this one-off thing. And we re realized we can generalize and fold any, any maze that you want any uh, pattern of horizontal and vertical lines, if you extrude it out of the surface, this is folded from one uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Uh, and you can use this also to write messages. Um, so in this case, I am, at MIT, everything is a number. So 6.849 is the class that I teach at MIT, uh, which is about folding. And so this is kind of illustrating the computational origami workflow. You come up. You start with your design of what you'd like to make in your head, or in this case we're drawing it on a computer. Uh, the algorithm tells you the crease pattern that you fold. You fold this, it takes about two days, and you get uh, this thing on the bottom as like the, the finished product. Um, and this class is actually uh, available online. You can watch videos, free streaming, uh, and learn all about the technique behind what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll show you this maze designer for fun. Uh, here's a 3D maze that we can fold from this crease pattern, uh, but we can also write a message here like pan, uh, and that would be folded from this crease pattern. So this is kind of a fun puzzle. If I just give you the crease pattern, what does it fold into? With a little practice, <laughs> you can figure it out. Uh, so um, here's some uh, art prints that we designed using this algorithm as well. So Here's a crease pattern um, and little gray patches, which don't look like too much up here. But if you fold this, uh, the gray patches come together to form the word no, and the 3D structure forms the word yes. So you have this kind of false shadow, which is pretty cool. 
<laughs> this uh, you, can, you can actually fold. Uh, this one I hope will never actually be folded. Uh, super complicated piece pattern, little gray patches that come together and make the word science in the foreground and art hiding in the background. Uh, and this is uh, one of a series of font designs. My dad and I have always really liked fonts since, since I was a kid, probably since he was a kid. I've never asked, actually. <laughs> He's nodding. So um, if you go to our website, you can find uh, lots of fun fonts that we've designed that are based around mathematical results that we have. And one fun way of sharing them with the world is to express these fonts, uh, express the mathematics through uh, font design. Uh, I will show one more later today. But if you want to see more, if you like fonts like we do, uh, check them out. Uh, we also like to make puzzles. Um, it's another way to take especially mathematical problems we don't know how to solve. These are mathematical unsolved problems. Um, they're really frustrating and hard, and not, it takes us a long time to solve them, so some we've never solved. Um, and one way to express how hard these problems are is to make fun folding puzzles. So here you're experiencing uh, a particular um, hard folding problem. This is a certain pattern folding puzzle. This is a map folding puzzle. This is related to organizer. This is a problem called turning inside out. Uh, most of these are still unsolved, uh, but you can get a feeling for what the problem is like by solving these puzzles. And these you can also find on our website, print them out, and try them. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how to build transformers, more than meets the eye, and uh, <laughs> terminators, and in general, reconfigurable robots. Uh, because the origami offers a, a possibility for how to actually make these this science fiction into real science. Make a one gadget, like maybe this is a gadget I push a button and it unfolds and refolds into a bicycle or something uh, else. Can I have a universal gadget that folds into many different things? Um, and this leads to the idea of a universal hinge pattern. Uh, if I took Orgamizer and I gave it a bunny, it would give me one piece pattern. If I gave it a uh, I'm thinking a rabbit. That's the same thing. If I, if I gave it a, a lizard or a chair or something, it would come up with a completely different crease pattern. Um, it turns out there's one crease pattern that can kind of do everything uh, up to some resolution. So you can take a square grid and draw these alternating diagonals. And this n by n pattern can make any shape made out of around n cubes. Uh, so you could, if you have some 3D surface, you can approximate it by little cubes in the same way that we pixelize images. This is called voxelizing a 3D surface. And then this one increase pattern can fold into essentially anything. Um, even more efficient, we have a, a new result this year about how to take just a strip of material, uh, fold this particular uh, crease pattern, uh, sort of zigzag creases, and again, you can make any surface made up out of little cubes. And this is extremely efficient. Half of the material of this paper will end up on the surface. There's almost no wastage. Um, and to illustrate this cool thing, we again made a font. So this is, the lid. this folds into, it's obvious, right? <laughs> this folds into the number nine. I had to look down there. I was going to say Z, but it's actually nine, eight, seven, six, and now the other end is A, B, C, D. Uh, let me show you. Again, it in action. So we can take a message like Japan is cool. And you know, this crease pattern, it's long, will fold into this message. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but you know, the, so the point is to make these foldings happen automatically. We'd like the gadget to fold itself. So these are examples, some early examples of self-folding, where you give this sheet of material a little electrical current, and there's little, essentially, muscles in the paper pulling the creases shut, and here you get a fully deployed table. Of course, this is a very small table. You can tell from your fingers there. Uh, and we've had a lot of successes with self-folding, and other groups have as well. Uh, there's a few different technologies for doing it. Uh, this example on the bottom left is going to fold into a boat and then a paper airplane. So it's a 4x4 four four grid. Uh, probably the most exciting one is, is up here. It started as completely flat uh, laminate of a few layers plus a couple of batteries and a couple of motors. Um, and it's going to fully fold itself into a fully functional robot, so no human intervention. And this is an area we call printable robots, where you say, ah, I'd like to design 
my new robot for the day. And about an hour later, um, and about $10, $20 of materials, you can make a fully functional robot, experiment with that robot, and make a new one tomorrow. Or you could imagine every child <laughs> having a, a, a robot. I mean, you can do lots of cool things. And the, you can customize your robot. You don't have to mass produce anymore. Every robot can be different. Um, and as you can see, it starts completely flat. We have little uh, actuators, uh, which are, the trade name is Shrinky Dink. Uh, it's pre-stressed polystyrene, is the fancy name. Um, and it's just the batteries are, are heating up that shrinky dink. It causes contraction, which pulls the creases shut, and it deploys into the 3D thing. And this is, again, using uh, computational origami design to figure out how to turn that 3D structure into a flat pattern. Um, now, one of the challenges when you go from paper, which is very thin, um, in our mathematical ideal, it's zero thickness, although it's really hard to buy paper like that. <laughs> Um, and you try to adapt them to thicker materials, um, like, like these flat sheet materials, uh, different plastics and so on. Um, you have to deal with thickness. Thickness is a, tech, is a challenge in the real world. And the first person to really analyze this formally is a high school student back in 2001. And she analyzed, if I fold a piece of paper in half n times, how, many, how big is that? How many times can I fold a piece of paper in half? Um, and it turns out the challenge is, is not really that the number of layers is doubling with each fold, but that to do a fold with really thick material, you need to bend the material around in a circle. And so um, this uses up length of paper, because uh, you can really only fold through the straight part here. You can't refold through the curved part. And so once you run out of length here to do another turn, and like in this picture, you're, you're out of room. And so it all comes down to how long is your piece of paper versus how thick it is. Uh, and she computed that with a three-quarter mile long piece of paper, she could do it in half 12 times with sort of regular paper thickness. This was a super jumbo roll of toilet paper, uh, very carefully folded to not tear at the perforations. And she holds the world record the number of times you could fold a piece of paper in half 12 times. It would probably never be surpassed unless someone can produce a like, three-mile long piece of paper. <laughs> Uh, but this is very useful for design, uh, so we can apply the same ideas to, in a more general form, if we have some idealized paper folding model, this folds into a simple thing called the bird base, um, and, uh, which looks like this, uh, but now, and it works for zero thickness material, we can come up with, automatically, with a way to tweak the design, add little holes and add some extra creases, so that it folds also with thick material. And here's a real world example. Uh, folding foam core into a very thick uh, version of the bird base. Um, and so this lets us take the mathematically ideal designs and turn them into real world designs that can actually be built. Um, okay, I'm going to shift gears again and talk about curved creases. Curved creases, oh, everything I've shown you so far is straight line folds. And it's very cool and we understand it quite well. Um, the frontier of computational origami is curved creases. This remains a big challenge. Uh, we don't know how, we don't have automatic design algorithms. We're still trying to figure out, even understand uh, most of these models. Uh, we don't even know whether they exist in a mathematical sense. Are they possible to fold perfectly? They look pretty perfect, but um, geometrically it's very complicated to, to prove that. Um, these are all designs that go back to a famous computer scientist named David Huffman. Uh, he invented something called Huffman Codes, which is in every cell phone uh, you have and probably every electronic device you've used, pretty much. It's used uh, for compression. Uh, but he also was a pioneer in curved crease folding, one of the first people to, deserve, to design the curved crease folds. These are all his designs, which we've uh, retroactively recreated by looking at his models and trying to understand what was the crease pattern that led to that folding. Uh, he died in 1999. Uh, we've been working with his family to document his work and understand how was, he how was he able to design with curved creases. He was a mathematician and computer scientist, but he wrote almost no papers about this. So it was all uh, locked in his head. Um, so here's a, a, an example of a design that we fully understand. So this is his crease pattern. It's just a bunch of uh, circular lenses. And it fold, this is a 3D uh, computer model of what it folds into. And this is an example of something we fully understand where uh, even with weird shapes, uh, we know exactly how 
this surface folds into a 3D thing, and that works well. The other designs, uh, we still don't know. Um, and so we've been experimenting and going back and forth between uh, making art out of this, uh, out of curved creases, and proving mathematical theorems about curved creases or other kinds of uh, pleat folding. I want to focus here on a particular type of folding, which is where you fold back and forth many times. There are several examples of it outside. Uh, the simplest example, uh, which goes back to the Bauhaus in the late 20s, is you take uh, concentric squares, fold them alternating mountain and valley, and fold the diagonals. You should all try this at home. Um, when you do it, the paper pops itself into this cool 3D saddle surface, uh, which for years is conjectured to be a hyperbolic paraboloid, which is a mathematical surface. Uh, very neat, and how does the paper do this by itself? Um, so my dad and I, when I was an early grad student, thought, oh, let's, let's try to, this is our first foray into sculpture together. Let's try to design sculpture using mathematics. So we came up with an algorithm that would convert any 3D polyhedron, like a cube, into a way to combine together several hyperbolic paraboloids, in this case, 24 of them, because there are 12 edges in the cube. Um, and you know, that's a sculpture. And every time you plug in a new uh, polyhedron, you get a new sculpture design. So it's using mathematics, but the result is in, in sculpture. Uh, so that was cool. Then back on the science side, we, we thought, well, you know, what's, what's making paper fold in this way? Let's try to build a simulator that understands uh, why is paper folding into these nice, cool saddle surfaces. This is an example where we have um, a hexagon of material instead of um, a square. And so it's a little bit cooler. And all that's happening in the simulation is that the paper is trying to become bent at the creases and is trying to remain flat everywhere else. And then nature is finding an equilibrium among all of these forces. So once you have the, that 3D model, uh, we took this back into sculpture. So this is a physical sculpture of a virtual model of a physical piece of paper, <laughs> uh, which we made uh, by 3D printing spheres with holes at just the right angles. So these aluminum rods make the crease lines of that concentric hexagon model. Um, it's about a meter in diameter. Uh, and this is, I mean, you could only build this in this way if you have a perfect 3D model of what's going on. So this is like sculpture proving that we have a simulator <laughs> idea. Uh, so you can see the back and forth between art and science, and it's really powerful and also a lot of fun. Uh, so we folded uh, probably tens of thousands of these hyperbolic paraboloids making sculpture. Uh, this is quite a surprise when we prove that, in fact, they don't exist. Uh, this is impossible. You, if you have a piece of paper with this crease pattern, you cannot fold anything out of it if you only crease here. Um, and we were kind of wondering about this, because if you look at this folding, it's not quite perfect. It's the little wrinkles down at the bottom. And we always thought, oh, you know, we're just not good enough folders. We, we didn't fold it perfectly this time, maybe next time. Uh, but it turns out, no, it's, you just can't do it. It's OK that we were failing, because everyone must fail in this process. So I encourage you to try it and do make the impossible. Um, what, what's probably happening is that the paper is adding extra creases to resolve this, this problem. And for example, we showed that if you add these diagonal purple lines uh, as folds, then it folds really nicely. It actually um, folds in essentially uniquely. And it makes, indeed, a very close approximation to a hyperbolic paraboloid. Uh, so with extra creases, this is possible. And it helps us understand mathematically what's going on with these foldings. We still don't know how to do this with curved creases, though, which is the next topic. So same kind of crease pattern, but now I'm folding concentric circles instead of squares or hexagons. Uh, I have to cut out a circular hole in this case. Um, we get this cool saddle surface of papers compressing in one direction, which causes it to curl in the other. Um, does this exist? I don't know. I think so. Pretty sure. But, um, so we started exploring this on um, the sculpture side. These are three pieces at MoMA in New York, uh, where we took, instead of a regular circle, which goes around 360 degrees, we took a kind of double circle, which goes around 720 degrees, like a parking ramp, um, and joined the ends. And we get a paper that twists and turns even more than a regular flat piece. Um, and what was especially surprising for us is with slight variations in the design, this one has a larger hole. This one we folded the creases harder. We get very different 3D equilibrium 
form. So this seemed really exciting and a rich space to explore both from a design perspective and from uh, a science perspective. Can we make an algorithm that automatically tells you, oh, I want a space station that looks like this. Uh, what, how can I start with some cur simple curved creases that automatically pop into that form? Um, here, uh, these are some pieces actually currently on display uh, here in DC at the Renwick Gallery. Um, these are kind of going back to the original idea um, where we take multiple pieces and uh, join them together. This, this uh, sculpture has five pieces of paper, each folded along concentric circles. This one has two, this one has three, um, and you'll see more examples of this outside. Uh, and this is what it looks like to put these sculptures together in movie time. In reality, this can take days or weeks to find a happy uh, equilibrium form. But each piece of paper is relatively flexible. You can squeeze it uh, and push it into the hole of another until you get, uh, and the, the paper will respond in some way, and we iterate until we get something we're happy with and it's symmetric and so on. Uh, we've built relatively large pieces. These ones are about this big. Uh, all self-supporting, um, and you know, paper is very strong when folded. These are uh, quite tall. Uh, it's not this big. I wish it was this big. Uh, so maybe this big, uh, but fairly small base, and yet it can support its own weight. This is the largest piece we've made so far. It can probably go bigger. Um, this one held together for about three minutes. <laughs> Long enough for the photo. This is a typical day at the office. Uh, and we like playing with expressing these forms in different ways. This is a little uh, video uh, that almost happened by accident, playing in Photoshop, just correcting white balance. But you end up with a, a fun way to look at the high contrast you get from light coming off of these surfaces, which are um, you know, alternating angle sharply. Uh, we also have lots of high-tech gadgets at MIT, so this is putting a curved crease sculpture inside a CT scanner, uh, which is just an x-ray machine with a turntable. Uh, so the piece is rotating, and you're seeing through the curved creases. So you, it's really cool. You see this sharp zigzag lines, even though these are completely curved folds, because you're seeing the alternating mountain and valley. Uh, so I hope this will unlock a whole new world of x-ray videography. Uh, it's really uh, stunning. Uh, we also play with installation. So here we were inspired by uh, air tubing that you use to connect your uh, dryer, I guess. Um, and it's pleat folded. It's got circular pleats, in fact, concentric, concentric circles. Well, they're all the same size. Um, and it turns out they're really compatible with our paper forms. It could actually lock two of the sheets together, or two of the uh, two tubes together. And so you can build a pretty static 3D object. This is a smaller example. We built them about double that size. Uh, yeah. we're, we're so good at putting this together, you know, it looked like we knew where to put every single piece, but in fact, that video was uh, us taking it apart, played backwards. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. <laughs> so uh, my dad is also a glass blower, and so we wanted to, and I'm also a glass blower, um, at MIT. And this is my dad blowing glass blindfold. Don't try this at home. Uh, and we wanted to uh, combine paper and glass in some natural way. And paper folding is, is a very tactile experience. You touch the paper. You could do a blindfold. It wouldn't be that hard. Um, so, uh, and there are competitions to do paper folding blindfold. Uh, but glass blowing is usually not done blindfold. Uh, this glass is about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than an erupting volcano. Uh, you don't want to touch it. But you can through uh, layers of wet newspaper. And this was, um, this was an attempt to make glass blowing a tactile experience and kind of unify it as a medium with paper folding. So here he's finished the piece, gonna break it off. Didn't even burn himself. It's unusual for him. <laughs> uh, made a lot of these glass heads. And here's what it looks like to put circular creases into a scored piece of paper. Uh, in movie time, again, in reality, this takes a bit longer. Um, fold this thing, it pops into its equilibrium form. If you fold it really tightly, you can squeeze it through a relatively small hole at the bottom of that glass after it's cold and push it around and it expands inside the glass. And this is really exciting also from a computational design perspective because 
the glass provides uh, an extra constraint on the geometry of what this paper can do. It lets you uh, access more forms. Uh, and so we've been playing a lot with uh, improving the glass design and getting it to interact with the paper in a lot of cool visual ways and also geometric ways. And these are the three pieces that are outside, uh, so you can check those out after. And now you know the secret of how do they get the paper inside <laughs> the bottle. It's like a ship in a bottle. Uh, and you can also serve your green tea. Uh, you know, green tea. I should warn you that there's a hole in the bottom, and there's also no hole here, and no, there's no hole here. So it's good for your paper tea, but maybe not for your actual tea. Uh, and then we can also fold glass. Uh, so this was an experiment uh, in taking completely transparent glass, and in this case we're folding it by hand with Kevlar gloves, into 3D forms and then come, again composing a few of these structures. Uh, you can fold it for about two seconds before the right. gloves catch on fire. Uh, challenging but very rewarding because you get this cool crisscross pattern so you can't see with paper. Uh, so that was uh, kind of a little tour of, there have been a lot of results along the way, both mathematical and uh, artistic in this pleat folding world. And it's a lot of fun for us to go back and forth and just to generally explore and not know, are we going to end up with a math paper, like some of the curve crease work, or are we going to end up with a sculpture? And that freedom lets us explore without uh, worrying too much. Because one of those usually succeeds, ideally both. Uh, I'll just show you a couple more examples. Lately we've been printing, uh, in this case, text onto the paper before folding it. And our first instance of this is to take the short story called The Destructors, which is the story that they're reading in the movie Donnie Darko. Any Donnie Darko fans out there? Yeah. It's a great movie. Um, and the theme of the movie and the short story, uh, it's by Grant Green in the 60s, is that destruction is a form of creation. So we took this as implicit permission to destroy the short story and fold it into uh, 3D structure. So in principle, all the text is still there. You just have to destroy the sculpture to read it. Uh, and yeah, there it is. Uh, and if you know Donnie Darko, you know this character. Uh, here's another example, a little more computer science-y. Um, you've probably encountered QR codes. A cool thing about QR codes is they're error correcting. So you can remove, I think, up to 40% of the code, and it will still scan correctly. So even though we've cut this huge circular hole out of this code here, uh, if you scan with your phone, uh, it takes a little while because it has to run all these algorithms. They will say, folding error. Um, and that's the name of these, these pieces. <laughs> these will not scan, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's not that fancy an algorithm yet, but in principle. Uh, and then we also uh, thought we'd try our hands at music. Uh, so it uh, turns out folded paper makes a good musical instrument. Um, these are straws made out of the same paper. in this kind of series of printed, folded things uh, is outside. Um, and it's based on this book called uh, The Book of Knots uh, by Ashley, uh, I forget which year, 80s maybe. Um, and it's, it's a famous book for anyone who's you know, sailed or uh, who ties lots of knots. Um, and as a tribute to that book, uh, it has 41 chapters. We imagine the 42nd chapter uh, where we took a page out of every chapter of the book um, and printed it onto one sheet and then folded that sheet into uh, this sculpture. So check that out afterwards. Um, I think I have one more example. This is kind of a fun note to end on where we, another way to combine paper and glass 
of course, is to pour hot glass directly onto paper. Again, don't try this at home. Uh, 2,000 degrees can easily burn your paper, but if you set things up right, it will just uh, scar the surface of the paper. A kind of uh, calligraphy drawing. We have con some control, although the glass also wants to do its own thing. Um, and it leads to really cool patterns with the uh, glass coils like honey does. Uh, and there's a well understood mathematical theory of model of how this works. Uh, but you can use it to draw some really cool patterns. Uh, you get yeah, fun coils. You get a nice over under pattern where the glass goes into the third dimension and leaves the surface of the paper. And so you get these kinds of drawings. Uh, and we like to do it together. Um, don't cross the streams, uh, for Ghostbusters fans. Uh, but we can, yeah, end up with some pretty complicated uh, pyro prints, we call them. And then, of course, to tie this all together, we can print this pattern onto a piece of paper and fold it into 3D sculpture. It actually looks burnt, although this is actually just printed. Um, and then to close the loop, we can take that paper and put it inside glass. <laughs> So I hope you get an idea that origami is a really fun uh, play space for us to do science and to do art. And uh, you can see lots of great examples of the origami art side outside. Um, and uh, thanks for coming. Enjoy the you know Professor Jimmy's lecture. So now at this time uh, we we welcome question uh, from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hands. Uh, we will bring you a microphone. Two things. One, your universal folding uh, result. Um, I know you're a mathematician yourself, but do you, what other mathematicians that work in what areas think that's closely related to, I'm assuming there are some theorems or results in algebraic geometry. Rather. And then I have an art question for you after the math question, which is, I was really fascinated, sort of as a quilter, I said, have a quilting vision that I've acquired. I was really fascinated when you said, if you get used to those crease patterns, you can somehow, you can sometimes see what it is. And can, can you uh, relay your subjective experience in words? If, uh, do you have surprise? Are you able to do this? Has it has the power to do this increased as you've worked in this area? OK, good questions. Uh, so the first question was about uh, what, what fields of mathematics are we using, or is this related to? Um, uh, I guess the main field of, algorithm, uh, field of mathematics we use is called algorithms, uh, which is about being able to specify with so much precision how, how these buildings work that even a computer can follow them. Um, but more specifically, discrete mathematics and also differential geometry, like you mentioned. Especially for curve creases, uh, differential geometry, which is all about smooth surfaces. And between the creases, these surfaces are smooth, and you can kind of patchwork it together. But in general, origami has become its own field of mathematics, and it integrates all these fields, and, but we have to develop a lot of new stuff. Um, and then the second question I'm going to interpret as uh, visualization and how does, uh, have you found that change over time? And the answer is yes. Um, when I started in geometry, I basically couldn't visualize anything. I was terrible. I mean, I was 15, but uh, I, I had no intrinsic ability. My dad had a lot of visualization ability from his art background, and that's why we started working together in math. Um, but it was all developed over time. And the more that we folded paper, it helped that we had a tactile medium. But also the more that we just imagined things in our head, the better that skill got. And we basically learned to be able to visualize paper folding to the extent that we had a competition regularly to fold origami models in our head without actual paper to see who could do it the fastest. What? <laughs> this is clearly a, a, an exercise of trust also. <laughs> Afterwards, we both realized that we had forgotten the step and then admitted it. So was... <laughs> but yeah, that's only possible with a lot of practice. You can't do that from the get-go. But luckily, it's a learned learn skill. Next. Oh, right, good. So I've got to wait for the microphones. Hello. Yeah. Hi. I wanted 
to ask about your circular crease pattern that's up on the slide right now. It, yeah. The crease pattern in two dimensions is completely symmetrical. Right. And then when it folds into 3D, it's not symmetric anymore. It has points on it which are special or unique. So what is responsible for that symmetry breaking? What's going on here? Uh, yeah, so what... Um, so the, the two-dimensional crease pattern is just circles. This has like an infinite number of symmetries. Uh, you can rotate by any angle and you get the same thing. Whereas in 3D, uh, this is not so. Uh, it only has like maybe four symmetries. Uh, where does the symmetry breaking come from? Uh, I guess the limitations of three-dimensional Euclidean space would be one <laughs> answer. Um, it's, it, essentially, this, this pattern can only exist in a fully symmetric form when it's flat. As soon as you start folding, uh, it's contracting in space, and there's just not enough room to fit that in a perfect way, uh, except by bending things out of plane. Um, and it just happens that the minimum energy state is when you have this kind of uh, up and down pattern with two ups and two downs. Um, but I, I don't think there's an intrinsic reason other than you, you try it and it, that's what it is. You can solve the equations and it seems to come out to that. But uh, yeah, it, it's. It's the particular constraints of three-dimensional geometry. Okay, next is that that gap. Oh, right yeah. here. Okay. It's going to be two parts. Um, the cat ears. Um, like, say I wanted to do something like that. Do you think just anyone could just go on the computer and try to fold that? Uh, you like, could definitely. Anyone can go and try. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, like we were saying earlier. It, it's hard in the beginning, uh, especially curve creases are kind of tricky. Uh, the general technique is first you score the paper, maybe with a compass, um, and then uh, go and fold it by hand, but it's challenging the first several times you try. If you do try, I would recommend only doing half circles against the edge of the paper. Uh, straight creases, on the other hand, uh, are relatively easy, and anyone can go and make the concentric squares model I showed you. Uh, within an hour, so I encourage you all to try that. And then, you know, origami is a, has a huge spectrum from beginning models to super crazy advanced that we wouldn't be able to fold. Next question. How do you make a 3D alligator? <laughs> well, you take your 3D alligator, uh, well, I guess you take your real alligator, you 3D scan it, you plug it into Orgamizer, it gives you a crease pattern, and you just fold along all the lines like it says, and. Seven days later, you'll have your. <laughs> or you wait several years for self folding to advance to the point where it can do the whole by itself. Good questions. I'm in the process of restarting the Origami Club at the University of Maryland. Do you have any suggestions for the club in general, based on your experience? Any, you know, what's worked, what hasn't? Um, I think what matters most in starting an origami club is enthusiasm by the club leader. So <laughs> step one accomplished. Um, so we have an origami club at MIT, which is this t-shirt. Uh, we started a convention, uh, which a lot of people attend. If you can make it up, and that's a bit of a waste of Boston, but uh, you should come check it out. Running a convention can definitely drum up more enthusiasm. But I think if you're excited and passionate about it, uh, it should be, should be easy. Do you give student grants? No. Uh, there is, MIT has a system for student clubs in general to get uh, money. Oh, I see travel grants. I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to try to figure something out. Thanks. I just think it's so uh, delightful and intriguing, the relationship that you and your father have. I wonder if you could comment, and I would love if your father would be willing to comment on that also. Um, yeah, we have a very special relationship. Um, I think it comes a lot out of the traveling we did together, which is a big bonding experience. Um, traveling together for four years, uh, you really get to know each other. And um, the, to me, the big distinguishing experience, I think, was that my dad always treated me like a peer, not as a child. And so we would make big decisions together, like, where are we going to go next? And when are we going to leave this place? When are we bored? Um, as a joint decision with equal equal partnership, and that I think that set us up for life to to do anything together. Basically, so, so. do you want to add? Uh, <laughs> you can take his mic. Yeah. Oh sure. Uh, I think one of the keys was listening to Eric and not making him learn 
things that he wasn't interested in. He's just letting his natural tendencies to discover everything grow all by himself. Yeah, so he would do crazy things, uh, which I didn't even know at the time until he told me much later, where uh, he would get, a this is before the internet, so he'd get a bunch of books from the library and leave them out on the coffee table, and just casually observe uh, which books I, uh, I picked up. And then he would say, okay, that's, okay, that's an interest, so I'll go to the library, get more books on that topic, and just leave them on the coffee table, never telling me I should learn this thing, just like making it possible and easy to learn. Um, you should all do the same. Yeah. <laughs> or parents. Uh, hi, um, my name is Shanti and I'm a big fan of your work. Thanks. And I have been experimenting with a lot of paper folding. Any paper doesn't go to the recycle bin before it's <laughs> And uh, I've been... Um, so uh, you're, you're pre-printing onto the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have a couple of questions. One that I've been longing to ask you for a very long time is, do you use any special kind of paper? Uh, when you do this kind of origami, and when you do the scoring for larger sheets, do you have a special divider panel for compass tool? Mm. And do you score on both sides? So you want to know all of our tricks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, we, we, um, we experiment with lots of different papers, always looking for which papers uh, have different features as the sort of vague, vague answer. But uh, depending on the type of origami model you want to make, you might want thicker or thinner paper. Generally, you want long fibers in your paper so it's not going to tear. Um, these, uh, let's see, these, there's a couple papers here. This is uh, elephant hide paper. There's a bunch of models outside made out of elephant hide. And this is a Mitante watercolor paper. You can get both, well, you can get this one in a typical art store. This one's a little bit obscure. And, these days, it used to be easier. Uh, but in Europe, it's still pretty popular. Uh, generally, we're looking for very reliable um, and uh, you know, nice paper. Uh, we're always experimenting and trying out uh, different ones. Um, the, this is relatively thick. With, uh, with straight creases, you might not want to go this thick. Uh, we use uh, something like a compass to score circular creases. We, sometimes we also play with uh, high-tech tools like laser cutters or CNC um, cutting tools that can pre-score an arbitrary pattern. But for our actual sculpture, we like to do it all by hand. Um, how long did it take to make your biggest piece? Ah, the biggest piece? <laughs> yeah, how many times did you have to wait for We like to say all of our pieces take a lifetime to make. Uh, but um, in the, the giant green thing that I, we How showed. How many times did you have to wait for uh, me to? We probably did it in the span of a couple of hours, but it's not the same style as these pieces, which can take actually much longer, even though there are only a few pieces, because they were just trying to make something big and cool looking for a photograph. Uh, for these pieces, we want to make sure that they will hold together forever, and that requires a lot more back and forth with the paper. So due to time constraint, uh, we will get two more questions. Okay. Uh, Make them good. <laughs> Hi. Okay, thank you very much for your lecture and your art. It's, it's really a pleasure. Um, I would, uh, my question is really about the concept of equilibrium that you mentioned, and if you could talk a bit more about that and how it relates to the material you're using. I was right. thinking about it particularly when you're using gla glass and folding glass, <laughs> given that, you know, there's a whole temperature dimension to the equilibrium. Right. So I was just curious to hear more about it. Yeah, so in, so what about what's this equilibrium thing I keep mentioning? Uh, you know, physics likes to balance forces, and this is what we call equilibrium. So uh, in these kinds of models, we have some very simple forces. Uh, if you take a piece of paper and uh, you know, curl it a little bit and let go, it will restore flat if you hold up one end. Um, and that's the elasticity of the material. So it's really crucial for all the things we're folding, including the sheet metal, that it's an intrinsically elastic material. When we crease it, we destroy that elasticity, or we change the memory of the paper. And then it, if you, if you take a piece of paper, try to unfold it from a crease state and let go, it will curl back. Um, and so that's, those are the forces the paper is feeling. And then the equilibrium is uh, optimally balancing out those forces. So that's what physics is doing all the time. Uh, you know, I'm not falling through the floor because of an equilibrium between our gravity and my muscles, I guess, to counteract the gravity. 
uh, and then you asked about glass. So glass is interesting because it's much more flexible than paper. Uh, paper cannot shear. Um, it, 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 it can't get longer in any dimension, it can't get shorter in any dimension except by folding. Glass can do almost anything uh, because it has a lot of thickness variability. Paper doesn't like to get thicker or thinner. Uh, glass is happy to stretch thinner uh, and even bunch up to some extent. Uh, and so it's actually hard to get glass to fold like paper does. And we have to force it a little more. It's, um, it's more delicate, I would say. Uh, and you can get glass to fold like paper, uh, especially using temperature control, like you're saying. So we've experimented with uh, torching the glass just uh, at particular crease lines to get it to only fold there. Because where it's cold, it's not going to move very much. Where it's hot, it's going to move more. It's hard to do a lot of lines. We can do like one line at a time relatively easily. So there's still a lot of open questions and, and things to explore with glass folding. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun and harder. Last question. What was the first thing you created out of origami? The first thing I created in origami? Uh, probably it was like an origami crane. That's not very exciting. Uh, my, my, the first thing I created that I was most proud of, let's say, or that I was proud of, is a, a dragon design by Robert Neal, um, yeah, which the origami the audience probably know. Neal's dragon. Uh, so you can check out the designs online. It's relatively simple. You can make it in about 20 minutes. And it's a cool looking dragon. And Robert Neal's work is actually outside. A lot of the polypetal designs are for his. He's, he's a magician, an origami designer. Cool guy. You should try it out. Thank you.